Um, what I'm going to be talking about uh, is how judges in Delaware uh, and uh, in other states in the United States, but primarily Delaware, adjudicate self-dealing transactions. Uh, to make it very simple, there are basically two kinds of self-dealing transactions. The first kind uh, are transactions involving the corporation, and we will be talking about uh, for the most part, corporations is the entity form rather than some other form. Uh, uh, between the corporation and a fiduciary that is not a controller, such as an officer or director. The second kind, which is the part, uh, the kind that will be focusing almost 95% of my comments on, uh, are transactions between the corporation and a controller, uh, which uh, in the corporate world means a, a controlling stockholder. Um, in Delaware, we judges have no problem dealing with the first category. That's easy. Uh, and I say that because Delaware has a statute, uh, Section 144 of the Delaware Corporate Code, and basically it says that where the transaction is between the corporation uh, and a non-controller fiduciary, uh, it will be that transaction will be reviewed uh, under uh, business judgment standards if one of three conditions is met. Number one, uh, if the transaction is approved by a majority of disinterested independent directors, if that's the case, then uh, it will be a business judgment review. Alternatively, uh, if a majority of the minority of the stockholders, and that means the uh, minority, you know, disinterested stockholders approved, similar effect. And thirdly, if none of the other two uh, conditions uh, are satisfied, then if the court finds that uh, the transaction is entirely fair. So under the statute, there are two procedural ways to avoid fairness review. That's easy. Uh, and uh, for those of you who may not know it, uh, if business judgment uh, review applies, that means that the court will uphold the transaction unless the transaction cannot be attributed to any rational business purpose, which is an almost impossible standard uh, for a shareholder, plaintiff shareholder to uh, meet. Now, uh, but if uh, the uh, well, let, let's, let me move on to the second category because that's the one that really matters for you uh, since I understand that uh, you know, a, a majority of the business uh, corporations here are uh, controller-owned, family-owned, large stockholder-owned, uh, and uh, those are much more problematic for us in Delaware. Uh, uh, in most of these transactions, at least the ones that end up in court, uh, take the form of so-called freeze-out transactions. Uh, that is, the controller initiates a merger to buy out the minority interest, uh, and uh, the controller has the voting power uh, to um, force that transaction through whether the minority approves it or not. Uh, so essentially, uh, that's uh, the rawest form of self-dealing. Uh, because the uh, controller is on the buy side and the sell side and is in a position to dictate the terms. Now, uh, in an article, a uh, very interesting article that Professor Goshen authored several years ago, uh, he uh, clarified for us that there are really four de uh, only four ways that courts can deal with these controller freeze-out transactions. One way is to do nothing, just allow them to happen and hope the market solves whatever agency problems exist. The second way is to prohibit them altogether, uh, but that doesn't work in the United States. Uh, these transactions are allowed uh, subject to judicial review of some kind. The third method, which I understand is a requirement of law in Israel, uh, is to uh, is for the transaction to be subject to a uh, approval by a majority of the minority 
investors or shareholders. And fourthly, uh, entire fairness review by a court. Now in Delaware, we've adopted the fourth alternative, entire fairness review. Uh, although uh, a vote of a majority of the minority is allowed, uh, it's optional. It is not required as a legal matter, uh, unlike Israel. Now, the, the, from a judge's point of view, and for those of you who are lawyers practicing in the courts, you need to understand how the judges view these transactions. How does entire fairness review operate? What really happens? The theory uh, that is the rationale behind this standard uh, is that the controller, which is usually which is a majority stockholder, uh, and the directors of the subsidiary corporation, most of whom are appointed by uh, the controller, are fiduciaries. Uh, and as fiduciaries, their task is to protect the interests of the minority, so that if the minority is being forced to sell their shares, uh, then uh, uh, the duty, the fiduciary duty of the controller and uh, uh, the directors is to uh, you know, do whatever uh, is necessary to make sure that the minority gets the best price. However, in a freeze-out transaction, it's the controller that's forcing the minority to sell. Uh, and uh, obviously in a situation like that, the fiduciary is hopelessly conflicted uh, because the fiduciary wants to buy at the lowest possible price and it can't do that and at the same time exercise its fiduciary powers to protect the minority to get them to force itself to pay a higher price. It just doesn't happen in the real world. Uh, so what we have in the, these transactions is that in the dynamic, the, in the real world dynamic there is no body, no actor uh, there to protect the interests of the minority. Nobody. And so what do you do? Well, uh, since no one, no actor uh, is there to protect the minority, the courts are the only agency uh, that can do that. And then the question becomes, well, how does a court protect the minority? You know, judges don't take off their robes and go on the board of directors and start negotiating uh, for the minority shareholders. The only way that courts can operate is by uh, procedural rules. And the procedural rules that uh, uh, entire fairness review involves are very, very stringent. Um, what the courts do is to impose, is basically to uh, presume that in these freeze out transactions, these controller transactions, that the transaction is unfair which means it will not be allowed to go through unless the fiduciaries, the controller and the board, the control board of directors can satisfy the court, can satisfy its burden of proving that the transaction is entirely fair, both as to process and price. Uh, and process, by process, and we'll get into this momentarily, I mean the decision-making process uh, the, the, the process by which the terms of the transaction were arrived at were communicated to the shareholders, uh, the process for uh, voting and approvals. And price uh, is a whole separate area. But my point at this stage is just to say that uh, uh, entire fairness is very strong medicine. Uh, for those of you who represent uh, controlling stockholders, uh, it is not a position that you want your client to be in uh, because of all of the, uh, both the uh, uh, litigation problems, the cost problems, and the problems of uncertainty that are inherent in entire fairness review. And much of what I'm going to be talking about uh, is how the law has changed over the past 30 years uh, to try to find ways around this form of review, yet allow uh, these controller transactions to go to, to proceed. So indulge me for a moment because I'm going to give you a brief history uh, of what's happened in Delaware. So, but, but really I'm doing that not because the, the history is so important, but because uh, uh, so to enable you to understand what the underlying problems have been with this form of review and the forces that have been in play uh, to try to obtain relief 
from it. So, uh, and incidentally, you know, entire fairness review, I'm, although I'm talking about Delaware law, uh, entire fairness review is not unique to Delaware. Most of the states in the U.S. Uh, have some form of it. Uh, this form of review has existed for the last, what, 150 years, Ted? Uh, it's been a long time. Uh, it is an old, it, you know, it is one of the two uh, bedrock standards of review in the United States. However, uh, it was not until 1983, uh, well, before 1983, there was no content to the standard. You know, the, the courts were told, yes, you've got to decide whether the transaction is entirely fair. But no, there was no instruction as to how the court should go about doing that. Uh, uh, you know, fairness, and the problem, of course, is that fairness, like beauty, to, to paraphrase Shakespeare, is in the eyes of the beholder. And so one of the problems was that, uh, uh, you know, the same transaction might be viewed as fair by one judge, but not fair by another. Uh, and there wasn't any metric uh, or guideline by which to objectively, uh, uh, you know, have the same transaction be adjudicated the same way. But in 1983, that situation improved when the Delaware Supreme Court decided a case, and it's a, it's a landmark case, and I'm going to be coming back to it several times, called Weinberger versus uh, UOP. Uh, in that case, the court, Supreme Court gave much more specific instructions as to how the trial court should adjudicate, and by the trial court I mean the Court of Chancery, uh, which is our business uh, court, five judges, how they should be adjudicating these freeze-out transactions and self-dealing transactions. And I, it's important to keep in mind that the court in Weinberger decided two very important things that changed entirely the way uh, in which judges go about adjudicating controller self-dealing. First of all, they clarified that fairness means not just fair price, although it does mean that, it also means fair dealing. And fair dealing encompasses uh, issues such as uh, you know, whether the transaction was timed in a manner that was unfair to the minority, uh, whether all material facts about the transaction were disclosed, uh, uh, and you know, disclosed to the shareholders and the corporation's board, uh, whether procedural devices such as uh, pr approval by a minority, a majority of the minority shareholders, uh, or uh, a special negotiating committee of independent directors. Uh, was used uh, as a mechanism to uh, avoid the terms being forced down uh, on the minority. Uh, the whole point, as the court said, is that the court is looking to whether the way the transaction was structured and carried out replicates, that is, is makes it like an arm's length transaction between two independent parties. Uh, now, let me pause at this point because uh, we're going to be coming back to it at the end, and that is uh, one of the one of the most captivating and unfortunately confusing aspects of the Weinberger decision is that in a footnote, the court suggested that uh, that if the controller made the transaction subject to approval by a majority of the minority stockholders or uh, uh, negotiated and approved by a special committee of independent directors, that would replicate an arm's length transaction. Uh, and uh, we all know, uh, or at least those of us back then knew, the, that uh, if an arm's length transaction under Delaware law is reviewed under business judgment, the business judgment standard, which is very management friendly. So the implication uh, of that footnote was that uh, if the controller agrees to be bound by the vo approving vote of a majority of the minority uh, or and or uh, a, uh, uh, the, the uh, 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 you know, negotiated result of a special committee of independent directors, uh, then uh, the standard of review 
would be business judgment and not entire fairness. Now, the court didn't say that, but that was the implication, uh, and that was the uh, conclusion that a number of uh, uh, lawyers in the uh, U.S. business community drew. Um, uh, and that is one of the forces, uh, that view that, uh, uh, that if the promise of Weinberger is met, then that should, there should be business judgment and not entire fairness review. That is a force that has been uh, uh, driving the evolution of our law since 1983 and up to today. Uh, so that's, that's fair dealing. Let me talk a minute about fair price because that is one of the most difficult problems uh, that Delaware courts have in adjudicating these transactions. Uh, the fair price uh, uh, before 1983 was determined by one method, and we called it the Delaware block method, but it was actually uh, a uh, capitalized earnings uh, methodology that had been uh, enshrined uh, by Professor Merrick Dodd back, I think, in the 1930s, and it was just one way uh, to uh, value a business, but somehow it became a, rule, a rigid rule of law, uh, uh, and by the time uh, Weinberger was decided, none of the investment banks were using it. They were using discounted cash flow, they were using comparable transaction uh, analysis, they were using comparable company analysis, uh, in addition to capitalized earnings. So the court held that uh, while it's, there's no problem, uh, there's no difficulty if the court wants to uh, use um, uh, capitalized earnings of the block method as a metric for valuation, it doesn't have to. Uh, the rule was and is that as long as the methodology is generally accepted in the financial community, translated, uh, generally accepted by investment banks and is recognized in the financial literature, the, the finance literature, uh, then that methodology will be ex admitted into evidence, will be considered by the court uh, in, in valuing the company. I understand that in Israel, the law is different, uh, that uh, discounted cash flow apparently is the only metric that can be used, but I, I'm told that by uh, the professor, but uh, and we use it a lot, but it's not the only uh, method. Now, uh, the uh, so my point is, this, is that although Weinberger has made it clear what the courts must do, it's also created a lot of problems. It's created challenges for us, which, if you'll briefly indulge me, I need to talk to you about for a few minutes. Uh, let me talk first about the challenges of fair price adjudication. The way that happens in the U.S. and in Delaware courts is that each side uh, hires an expert to testify. The, the purpose of the, what the, the job of the court is to decide what is the fair value, which is a statutory term undefined, um, of the corporation at, on the day of the merger, at the time of the merger. And that is a subject for expert testimony. And so each side will have an expert. And uh, this is a typical way, a typical scenario for a Delaware uh, fair price adjudication. Let's assume that on the day of the, uh, well, before the merger was announced, the price of the stock was $50. $50. And uh, then the merger uh, takes place and the price, the merger price is $60, $10 above the market price. The case goes to trial and the plaintiff hires an expert who testifies, who renders an opinion that the fair value of the company is $100 and the company's expert testifies that the fair value is $40 which is $20 below the merger price. This is a typical type of situation. So what do you do as a judge? Well, uh, the first part of the analysis is easy. That is, the first thing we do is to determine whether either uh, or both of these experts' opinions are admissible, which means that uh, we look to see whether their theory uh, or methodology evaluation is recognized in the finance literature. Most of the time it is. Uh, 
There, are, I've had cases where they're not, and uh, have, other judges have, and they will not admit that to testimony. It just won't be considered. Now, in a normal litigation, uh, what that means is that the other side wins. But that's not the case in Delaware in valuation because uh, it's possible that the other side's testimony will be admissible. It's possible that it won't, but it doesn't matter because the court has to decide independently how what the value should be regardless of what the experts say. And that's a problem because I'm not a finance expert. I never took finance, uh, a day of finance, uh, uh, you know, in law school or college, and most of the other judges don't either. Uh, and so the real problem is uh, when you get this kind of skewed testimony, how does a, a lay judge, a non-expert, finance expert judge, go about to making an independent determination of value? Uh, well, uh, and, and uh, you know, why are we, and why do we do that skeptically? And there's several reasons. First of all, because the expert's opinion uh, are, is usually litigation driven. Again, we talk about a merger price of 60. Plaintiff's expert says, no, it's worth 100. Uh, defense expert said, no, it's worth 40. Uh, so even if both experts use some recognized valuation method, like DCF, discounted cash flow, uh, they use entirely different inputs. That is, they may use different projected earnings. Uh, they will use different costs of capital. Uh, they'll uh, uh, use different present value discounts in order to work backwards and get to the number that they want. Uh, and it's typical that the uh, testimony, the, the opinions of both of these experts, these dueling experts, uh, are so different that uh, a lot of times we wonder whether they're talking about the same company. Um, so uh, what happens if the judge disbelieves one or both experts? Again, uh, we have still have to determine independently the fair value of the company. Uh, uh, how do we go about doing that? Basically, since we're not, you know, we don't know any more about finance and a lot less than the experts, we try to use historical reality and common sense to test the credibility uh, of the opinions that, that are being offered to us. Let me just give you a couple of examples. We have the defendant's expert. The, this, the company has decided that the uh, merger price will be $60. And then they, hi they, they hire an expert. And, and let's, they, they hire an expert uh, uh, before they did that uh, uh, to, to advise them. And let's assume uh, that the, ex the original expert gave them an opinion. We don't know what it was, but they never called that expert to testify. Instead, they did they picked a number, they picked sixty dollars without expert advice and then hired the expert who's testifying in court to um, uh, tell me that the uh, value is forty dollars. Uh, okay, you know, if those are the facts it makes it a lot easier to disbelieve the number because the historical truth is just at odds with that. The, Let's turn to the plaintiff's expert. It says this company's worth a hundred dollars. Well, you know, we take a look at the history of the company's sales and profits over the last five years, ten years, uh, and you ask, okay, if this if this was the level of profits that was made, the level of the volume of sales, you know, under any kind of common sense notion of value, would this these numbers justify a a uh, hundred dollar price, uh, particularly if no company in the industry ever sold above seventy dollars. If uh, let's assume those are the facts, uh, in that case, it's easy or easier to discount this hundred dollar number. It doesn't help you uh, uh, necessarily get to a single price, but it does give you an independent view of the company based on the, the objective facts uh, and to then try to do the, whatever best we can. Uh, and I know you're probably thinking, this is crazy. You know, uh, and, and there is something a little crazy about it. The valuation process is inherently imprecise, imprecise, uh, which is why 
in a real deal, uh, as those of you who do uh, trans uh, merger transactions know, in investment banks will say, well, fair, a fair price is somewhere in a range between 40, let's say 40 and $70. They're not going to say it's 41 or you know, 69. It's a range. Uh, and that makes sense uh, because of the imprecision of the inputs uh, that go into valuation determination. But that doesn't really help us. Why not? Because our task is to come up with a number. It's got to be one number, and uh, that makes it quite difficult. So, uh, you know, that's part of what we wrestle with. So, to recap, number one, the expert opinions are litigation driven. Number two, the valuation process at its best is imprecise. And the third is that it's very expensive uh, because it costs a lot of money. Uh, to hire these experts to do a study, to testify in court. Uh, the, you know, it takes court time, it takes lawyer time, it does not come cheap. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why the corporate bar has attempted ever since Weinberger to come up with a way to avoid judic adjudication under entire fairness. Uh, they've done that by uh, in different ways. They've used uh, independent committees of directors to negotiate uh, and approve a transaction or and or approval by a majority of the minority shareholders. Uh, and then they would argue that their deal should be adjudicated uh, under uh, business judgment and not entire fairness. And basically going back to Weinberger, saying this is what Weinberger means. Unfortunately, that argument has not worked. Uh, it has not met uh, with much success, and to explain why, uh, I need to indulge you again, and I'm going to end uh, my talk with a story, a real story, uh, and then suggest what the next chapter of this ongoing saga will be. Um, let's, uh, let, let me return first to the challenges of doing fair process analysis. And I ask you to assume with me that uh, we have a corporation, Corporation A, and it owns 70% of Corporation B, so a parent subsidiary. And uh, let's assume that the board of the controlled corporation, Corporation B, has 10 directors, seven of which uh, are senior executives, highly paid executives of Corporation A, three of them are independent. Corporation A, for valid reasons, decides that it doesn't make sense to own 70%, that it really should be, it should own 100%. And so it wants to buy out the remaining 30% minority. And the board uh, of the parent wants to do it the right way. You know, they don't want to cheat anybody, so they appoint the three indiv uh, independent directors to negotiate as an independent committee. Uh, the merger price, they give the uh, committee the authority to just say no, that is to veto any deal unless the uh, committee approves it, uh, to hire their own lawyers, to hire their own investment bank at the uh, parent company's expense, all of that. Uh, and uh, uh, let's also assume that on top of that, uh, the controller agrees that uh, uh, the deal will not go through unless a uh, majority of the minority of the stockholders also approve. So this is what we call in U.S. parlance a clean deal. It's a perfectly clean deal. Uh, there's no exercise of coercion or force by the controller. Uh, it's as close to negotiating an arm's length transaction, at least that I can imagine. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we had two cases like that, one in 1988, a case called TWA Shareholders Litigation, decided by uh, then Chancellor Allen, and a second case in 1990 called Citron versus DuPont, which was decided by yours truly, both of them involving perfectly clean deals. Uh, and uh, in both cases, uh, uh, although they came up in different <coughs> procedural contexts, the uh, transactions were approved. Um, in the TWA deal, the chancellor uh, effectively held that the uh, transaction would be uh, reviewed under business judgment, which is what one interpretation of Weinberger uh, 
Uh, in the DuPont case, uh, I unfortunately could not come out that way uh, because I believe that I was bound by a decision by the Delaware Supreme Court in 1985 called Rosenblatt versus Getty Oil Company, uh, uh, a case which applied the entire fairness standard but found that the deal was fair even under entire fairness review. And I have to pause for a minute to talk about this Rosenblatt case uh, because it was a, it's the source of a lot of the problems that we've had. That was a case uh, uh, that, uh, like Weinberger, but decided uh, four, five years later involved a perfectly clean deal. Uh, yet the court uh, uh, imposed entire fairness review, but because it was a clean deal, uh, that is, uh, it involved uh, an independent negotiating committee and majority of the minority, uh, or at least one of the, an independent committee, uh, held that although entire fairness would be the test, uh, the burden which would shift from the uh, defendants to the plaintiff to show that the transaction was unfair. The problem with that case is that the court didn't say why. Uh, it was decided after Weinberger, but they didn't really distinguish Weinberger. There was no rationale for this burden-shifting approach. And so, uh, but I felt that I had to follow it. And so as a result, we had, as from 1990 to 1994, two Court of Chancery decisions going different ways involving the same transaction structure, uh, which was a perfect storm uh, for the Delaware Supreme Court to have to resolve uh, which case was right. And the court did that in a case called Kahn versus Lynch Communication Systems in 1994. And they went the way I went. That is, they reaffirmed their own uh, Rosenblatt decision. And so what we have now is that even if you have, it appears that even if there is a, uh, there are procedural protections in a, in a self-dealing freeze-out merger context that, re that replicate arm's length negotiation and arm's length deal, entire fairness still is the standard of review, but the burden shifts uh, to the plaintiff. The problem with that approach is, again, is that it still subjects uh, the parties to high cost uncertainty, including the fact that uh, you never know whether the burden has shifted until the case is decided uh, because uh, the court can't determine whether there's been a, an effective cleansing devices until it's made fact findings after trial. So it's not a very uh, effective approach, but that is uh, the law. Uh, Lynch res, you know, resolved the doctrinal issue, uh, but it didn't resolve the underlying problems uh, to entire fairness review, which are the cost of litigation, the uncertainty of the outcome, and the uh, deal uncertainty. Uh, and added to that is the inherent difficulty in applying the standard. Um, th the evidence of that is there are two cases uh, I'll just name them. Uh, one was uh, Emerald Partners versus Berlin. The other is CD versus Technicolor. Those were two merger cases that went up and down our court system, I think to the Delaware Supreme Court at least three times, another one four times, in order to evolve all, uh, to resolve these different procedural <coughs> problems that have been created uh, by this case law of ours. So uh, what I'm trying to say, and I'm about one minute to go, is that the effort to mitigate the expense and uncertainty of entire fairness review uh, has continued. Uh, one example has been a series of two-step acquisitions uh, where the controller that, lets, that owns, let's say, 60% of the stock uh, uses a tender offer to increase its ownership to 90% and then uses the Delaware short-form merger statute uh, to acquire the other 10%. Under existing Delaware law, neither of these transactions viewed alone or in isolation is subject to fairness review. And the question was, if you put them together, uh, do you then have to have fairness review? There's a series of decisions by the Court of Chancery, not our court, which says no, uh, there's no fairness review. And so we now have two, uh, you know, two different transaction structures, one of which that, that are economically identical, one of which uh, requires fairness review, the other of which avoids it. There's one recent development that uh, some of you may know about, and it's going to be the next chapter 
uh, of this story. Uh, five, four weeks ago, uh, the Court of Chancery decided a case called uh, MFW, that is McAndrews and Forbes, uh, shareholders litigation. Uh, and uh, basically what happened in that case is that the defense bar uh, mounted a direct challenge to Conn versus Lynch and all of the jurisprudence that had been decided since then and argued, uh, and that, by the way, this was a case where there was both an independent negotiating committee and a uh, majority of the minority vote. It was the perfect, clean deal. And they held that uh, the, you know, courts have, the courts have been misinterpreting um, uh, Weinberger, that the correct interpretation of Weinberger is that when you have both of these cleansing transactions or procedural uh, uh, protections, then business judgment should be the standard of review and not entire fairness. The chancellor agreed, and that is a landmark decision. Uh, which uh, I think it's, it's inevitable that it will be coming up to our court, so I can't discuss the merits. Uh, but what I can say is that it looks like we now have to face squarely uh, what the court in Weinberger only implied. Uh, we now have to decide directly. And all of the five of us who will have to decide it, none of us were judges, let alone members of the Supreme Court at the time that Weinberger was decided. I apologize for going over my time, but thank you for your attention.